think is impossible and coming together and make it possibly. And uh, so NASA does have a very a good plan to now from its three phases, International Space Station, I'd like to highlight a bit more the last 17 years, living, working in low Earth orbit, moving out to cis-lunar, Earth-Moon orbit, prove the technologies. We have a great panel coming up on the space technologies, things we don't know how to do today necessarily that we have to learn how to do. First and foremost among those from the Langley point of view, I think entry, descent, and landing, and uh, many others in terms of the robotic capability, and then finally phase three, getting to, to Mars. I think it really is to advance all of our science, our engineering, our technology, to raise humanity up, and it's also to look for innovation, and it is global exploration. It's for the world. We'd like to lead in the US and NASA, it's for the world. We really are looking to leadership across the globe. And great keynote tomorrow, we're going to hear about that too, in terms of how critical all of our international partners are and their partnerships have been over the last 100 years. So I want to start with uh, this first phase, just highlight a few things. 17 years living on the International Space Station. It's only 400 kilometers up, just 250 miles up there. We can wave. You can look every 90 minutes and wave at the astronauts. But we're learning incredi incredibly important lessons so how we can keep astronauts healthy and safe for long duration missions. What technologies can we test, use it as a test bed so that we really can demonstrate those technologies to send us out into deep space. I have a little snippet here from, from Scott when he did his one year mission. I asked him, Scott, if you could invest in what technologies on space station from now to further our mission to Mars, what would it be? And here's, here's what he told me. Yeah, I think the uh, life support systems that, that we need to keep us alive in space are uh, ideal candidates for, for demonstrations for our future journey to Mars, as well as, as, well as uh, space, space suits. We need, I think, new spacesuit technology that uh, you know, requires less maintenance uh, in space and uh, you know, something that's easy, going to be easier to work in on the surface under the, uh, the Martian gravity. Okay, so he might have known my history, I have to say. <laughs> a little bias there. But I have to share a true story with you. I was there uh, up at headquarters in my office, and a call came in from area code 713. Well, that's Houston, right? That's Johnson Space Center, but I was in a meeting, so I said, oh, well, let's finish up the meeting, and I'll, I'll, get, I'll, I'll try to call GSC back, right? Well, when you see 713, and then you see the 1000 code, the operator code, don't ignore that, because that was Space Station calling me, which I, you can't just call back to Space Station. So that was Scott calling me at headquarters. I said, I can't believe it when I got my message. But he was telling me, David, we gotta do something about these suits. I just got beat up on an EVA doing my space walk. So, uh, but again, a lot of technology development. Right now, we are on this journey, thinking about putting, you know, the strategy together, what are those technologies we really need to buy down? What can we demonstrate, use Space Station as a technology test bed so that we really can go out to deep space? We're well on our way. I just have a, a picture here to remind me my specialty, as was mentioned, is in trying to keep astronauts healthy and well in the biomedical aspects. What we've learned now from Space Station, especially getting into the omics, the genomics, about the microbiome, how things are changing drastically for these six-month, one-year missions, and then first and foremost, what are we going to do about the radiation environment? In low Earth orbit, we're protected. When we get out to Earth-Moon orbit, we get out to Mars, we have to get radiation protection. I'm very optimistic. I think it might be in the future, the next 100 years, maybe even the next, next decades, you know, the biology, the engineering coming together. You know? Are there radiation-hardened people? Uh, possibly. So we've always thought about radiation shielding and protection, but now the life sciences, the engineering are really coming together. And uh, just phenomenal, and we'll keep doing all that incredible research uh, up through 2024. I have to stop and mention now the, the proving ground. What are we going to test out, and how are we going to get there? We haven't had heavy lift launch access, and now we do. It's well on its way to be demonstrated in the very near future, and then all of the 2020s, we get to take Space Launch System, the heavy lift, with the Orion capsule, and really make these investments to further humanity in our exploration pursuits. So I have to show you this video. All these videos are about the people. So the Mars exploration, great technology. I love the technology, I'm an aerospace nerd, but it's about the people, it's about all of us coming together. And you'll see that again in the thousand people uh, that are working on SLS across all of the states in the US.
very bright, and did I say a thousand people? A thousand companies are working on the Space Launch System in Orion across the U.S. You know, really is NASA, the government, investing in private industry, as well as bringing on academia to do the research. We really are all in this together to really bring these dreams alive for the next decade of human space exploration. But I stop for a minute and pose and show you this, uh, what I call my infographic. It's not an eye test, but what it is is the human history of Mars missions. We started in the 1960s. They're color-coded by, by nation and uh, Russia. You see their former Soviet Union, then the United States, Europe, India. The point is, all those red X's, those were failures. I, gave, I got to give an award at NASA for failure, to fail smart. But it's hard. Mars is really far away. It's hard. It really is trying to achieve the impossible. But look at all those green checks I highlight in the last 15 years. Because we've been getting it right. Why? Because lessons learned. Passing on best practices. Because anyone's success is all of our success. That's how we look at it. All of those, those landings, the flyby first, then the orbiters, and now the landings. The world has seven assets on Mars today. NASA has five. The rovers, MS, MSL, Curiosity being the grand, but also MAVEN, the orbiter. But the Indians have a Mars observer in, called MOM, which I love. And the Europeans now, the ExoMars. So we're all in this together, sharing that data to make sure that in the future, how can we all, how can we succeed? How can we all succeed together? So that's kind of my truth in advertising. Uh, some recent data about the flowing water on Mars, seasonal, very high salinity, High percolates, can't drink it, would kill you, hence we need more advanced life support systems. But just phenomenal scientific discovery. We knew there was ice on Mars poles, but now we know there's actually seasonal flow. So that's a breakthrough scientific discovery. I mentioned MAVEN. This is an incredible simulation. The data from MAVEN is an orbiter at Mars today, helping us understand how Mars lost its atmosphere. Earth and Mars, both 4.5 billion years old each. 3.5 billion years ago, Mars probably had water, was warm, and perhaps its own life support system. So what went so terribly wrong? Maven and the rest of our observations are giving us is that you literally see the solar radiation and wind ablating Mars' atmosphere. Mars today is left with 1% carbon dioxide atmosphere. It does not have a global magnetic shield. Lucky for Earth, we have our global magnetic shield. That's what separates us, life and life we're looking for, our past life in the universe. So again, amazing results coming in. We keep studying, we keep learning. And uh, in the 2020s, before we can get humans there, it's all about the technology and the rovers and what we can develop. And uh, shout out to Langley here, because Langley has to leave, has all the expertise in entry, descent, and landing. You saw in the SLS video, we're coming in hot. With all the Mars successes we've had with the rovers, we know how to land one metric ton. Maybe two. I promise you it doesn't scale. We have to figure out how to land 10, 20 metric tons. So that's a critical high. These are all high, high priority technologies understanding. In situ research utilization. We have to live off the land. All successful exploration in humankind has learned to live off the land. We can't bring everything with us. So the challenge that we have is, okay, all of you engineers, make the maker. We need the maker bot on Mars, but you have to make it. It really is a transformer replicator. You have to make that out of the basalts and what you have there. So these are really tough challenges. We mentioned entry, descent, and landing. Then we have to learn how to ascend as well. Mm -hmm. So there are life support systems, radiation I mentioned, power, energy, all these things are really uh, kind of, in the 2020s, again, I see it as how can we innovate? How can we truly have the synergies we need between science and engineering, how, how do we reach that convergence and the plan to really get humans exploration built on these technologies for, for our visions of getting there. So I put up a little map here uh, for uh, my NASA colleagues, myself, it helps me think about how do you innovate, maybe in four different domains, continuous innovation, you do your best, that's what NASA does so every day, about 80% of innovation is continuous. You're changing your business model, you're changing your organization, or you're making improvements in the technology. You're just doing incremental or continuous innovation all the time. Then you can do disruptive innovation. And that's when you change your model. You change your business model. For NASA, it's changed our organizational model. You know, how can we get people together doing different things? Revolutionary 
innovation is about the technology. What are those breakthrough technologies that will, again, give us, get us the next step? And you transform both the organization and the technology together, I, you have transformative technology. That's really hard. That's really hard. Innovate, transform it by changing your business model as well as changing your technologies. So that picture kind of looks like this. Uh, we looked around uh, NASA, we got 100 best practices, 100 great examples. I have time just to uh, highlight a few of them, some of my, my favorite ones. So continually, what are we innovating on? What's happening, again, across the agency? I like to hi highlight all the good work that needs to continue. As Lisa mentioned, we are really working hard on diversity, equal opportunity, have mission STEM to hold, this is for the university grantees. Come to NASA, talk to us about the compliance and kind of like, how are you doing? Are you making your marks? And we all learn from one another. How's the government doing in diversity and inclusion? How is academia doing? And industry, how are you doing? We are spending billions of dollars and we're not making much progress, I would tell you. So let's think about a different way to do it. Keep making those expenditures, but again, I think personally it's about the goal. Let's set high goals, make it hard enough we can achieve it, but uh, you know me as a, as a nerd and do the regression analysis at 1% growth of women or underrepresented folks in our pipelines today, it's till 2021 till I reach equity and parity. Well, that's not good enough because I won't be along. I'll be on Mars well before we really get this straight. So we have to think about how do we innovate in these spaces? How do we talk to each other? How do we share best practices? Because some people are doing really well. We want everyone to do better. Really learn from all these things. I have to give a shout out to another uh, kind of continuous innovation. I had the pleasure to uh, be at the Langley sponsor. What's the next 100 years of aerospace? Really, what we know, we celebrate the past, but what's the next 100 years? So it's 100 years of aerospace, but what do we talk about? Artificial intelligence, new jobs, new work. We talked about what are the big things in the next 100 years. There's going to be a Friday panel on this. I can't wait to hear the report since I got to participate in it. And the computations, and the computational, the big data capabilities that we have today are really breakthrough. And when humans become hybrid, and that's more to my specialty, we will get rid of disability. I think we can do that. You know, when humans and machines really are one, we really are at that verge of technology. So thinking about a very, very exciting future. Disruptive, couple, couple examples there for disruptive innovation. Again, this is about changing, uh, changing what you're doing. It's not about the technology, it's about changing practices. So an example from NASA then is for the space station, the public-private partnerships. That's a huge step forward. I called it the new NASA when I got in to say, wow, you really are betting on industry. You're really facilitating the investments in industry, industry to get cargo up to station. And in the future, as it was mentioned, to get our crew there. That's critically important, those new relationships, those new partnerships, that innovation, because then it allows you to go further out. Another uh, example I'd like to highlight, as I mentioned, I think it is about international partnerships. How can we do that innovatively? How can we team differently? Who can lead? Who can lead perhaps in a, in a lunar lander? Uh, if SLS can get you there. So thinking about we work together, we work together scientifically, how can we work together then it's in organizationally to get these, these things down, to really accomplish our dreams. So we do have some good models and frameworks, I think, starting from um, the internet, the five main partners on space station, but 95 nations have been to international space station. So it really is global. Moving on to some of the technologies, especially some of the transformative aeronautics uh, concepts that are going on, which couldn't be more exciting. And uh, we've probably all seen this, but I have to give a huge shout out. And again, putting the, the plan in place to say, yes, let's make the decade long inv investment. Let's have that low boom supersonic craft. We need it, right? We get to all the cities in the world, most of the cities in less than six hours. That would be fantastic. And it will be quiet and that is a huge contributor to the economy. So make no mistake about it, all these investments in the research and technology and aeronautics are the largest contributor to the US economy. That's why they're so important. The ultra-efficient aircraft, 50% fuel reductions, and a quarter getting the, the emissions down to one quarter of what they are today, one quarter of the current. That's breakthrough. Those are revolutionary technology investments that NASA's leaving them on the little one on the bottom, the electric, electric hybrid, going into uh, biofuels and going into electrification for the transportation system. Those are really hard, but those are revolutionary um, 
innovative technologies that the NASA is well on its way, hoping to keep those investments going on. These explants, these experimental aircraft are so, so critical. And again, a lot of them just stem right here from, from NASA Lively. So if that's not hard enough, how do we transform things? How do we find life in the, the universe? Um, how do we really transform aviation for it to be sustainable? A couple examples here, I'm starting again with ocean worlds, one of my favorite topics. This is to scale, I love this chart, because Earth's and Earth's oceans, to me, are the most important. So I've sailed around the world uh, looking at those, um, and, but now Enceladus is talking to us. It is literally, those plumes um, of methane and hydrocarbons are coming out. Those are the chemical constituents for life. Could there be life on Enceladus? Europa, another favorite target. That's a heat map. A heat map, potentially, of there is water there, we know, underneath the big ice sheet, so let's go. Be going and looking at it, sniffing, if you will, those chemical constituents. Titan and Triton and, and Ganymede, these are all great, great places to look. They are ocean worlds that we can search and look for the evidence of life. Coming back down to transforming aviation really transforming our business models, our organizational structures, how do we realize and sustain um, these aircraft, this X-plane of the future. I actually love uh, NASA's strategy here. It has three legs in computations. Again, what Langley was kind of built on and done, and the experimental work. So it's the computations, it's the modelings, it's the supercomputing, and then going on with the experimental designs and testing them in the wind tunnels. The third leg is the flight testing. So it's the computations, it's all the work in the wind tunnels, you combine that with a third leg, you never know in terms of X-planes and aeronautics until you really test and fly it. And that's really where the strengths are. So it looks like a very, very bright future to really attain some of these revolutionary uh, transformative technologies in aviation. And um, again, back to the economy and back to why this research and technology is so important. There's a four, four billion extra passengers in commercial aviation coming up in the next 20 years. So we need these capabilities. We need these greener aircraft, quieter, safer, and yes, faster as well. So I hope we can realize that. Uh, again, the next 100 years looks like it. I guess I'm hoping in the next few decades that this transformative innovation in aviation can, can be realized. I wanna come back down to Spaceship Earth for my final comments. Also, I didn't know when I came to Langley on that visit a couple of years ago, the fundamental science and contributions to earth science. I wanted to highlight some of those because it's near and dear to my heart as well. And um, you know, this perspective, everyone says, that's the benefit we have of looking in the orbital view, looking down on earth. We really see earth, as Buckminster Fuller coined, as spaceship earth. We're all in the spaceship together. We have to figure this out. Those are the 20 satellites, including uh, Space Station, was mentioned with amazing Earth-observing capabilities. Earth-observing capabilities. We look at Earth as a system to see how we're doing, to check. So I'd like to show you a little bit of data here. This is average global temperature data for the 100, last 140 years. We've increased close to a centigrade. Uh, sorry, I speak in... Uh, International SI unit says plus or minus two degrees Celsius. That's plus or minus four degrees Fahrenheit for the Americans. But uh, again, we are international. We have to talk to the rest of the world. And so it's audience participation time. Uh, raise your hand, if you will, when you're born. We're into the early 1900s here. Okay. This is from the average is blue. And yellow and orange are one to two degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit. <coughs> So that plays through 2015. We have the data in for 2016. Um, 2014 set all records, surpassed by 2015. 2016, in terms of average hot temperature, is just surpassed it. So guess what my prediction is for next year? And we have the data. We have to communicate, show the story, and help people, empower people to make decisions of what do we do about this. Temperature is easy, carbon dioxide. This is this is human-made carbon dioxide, again, NASA simulations for modeling from all the data, from the satellites to the air campaigns. So we don't want to be over 400 parts per million in terms of carbon dioxide. Again, a simulation, take a look at the Northern Hemisphere. This is a time series from 2014 into 2015, in case you can't see the date. So there we go in November. Look at the, and it goes up to the stratosphere, which is really important to see where this carbon dioxide is trapped. This is greenhouse gas. 
and is going up to 20 kilometers. You don't want to see yellow and orange. That's over 400 parts per million in terms of CO2. So take a look during the winter months, there's February of, of the world and uh, the earth and specifically the northern hemisphere emissions. So that's the data, that's the science, that's what our data shows. And now it's, what do we think about tomorrow? We have a great panel on, you know, earth observations for society, for humanity. Again, we're all in this spaceship together, we're all in this lifeboat together, what can we do about it together? I had the incredible privilege to fly on a NASA aircraft over Western Antarctica to look at the glaciers, to look at the ice, and uh, it was on my bucket list. Uh, and NSF, uh, thank goodness, I got to go down to the, the South Pole and run around the, the world in three seconds. It had taken us 18 months on our circumnavigation on our boat. So it was really cold, but it was worth it to spin around the South Pole. And I'd like to show you one more simulation here in the, the top right. Um, this is from, from NASA's Ice Bridge, the aircraft that flies in Greenland and then Western Antarctica to show you uh, the melt in Iceland, uh, 287 gigatons per year. That's uh, more than three times the size of Texas. So with the Greenland ice shield, and this is this amazing uh, simulation based on all of the data, it's not just the volume of ice that we're losing, it's the velocity, it's the rate of flow and the calving. The Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet together are 99% of Earth's fresh water trapped in ice. So as they disappear and change over the seasons, there's incredible consequences, incredible consequences. Over the last 20 years, we've had uh, um, 20 centimeters of, of sea level rise, but if the Greenland ice sheet goes is six meters. If Antarctica ever goes, you're talking 60 meters. We can prevent it, I think we can, we need to, talk about this, have the conversation, and see how we can all, again, for society and for the world, the spaceship, what do we do together uh, for some of these alarming results? So, again, I, I coined but Mr. Fuller, uh, mentor inspiration to me in, in my work and my work going forward as well. We have the potential to make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time, it is urgent, through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the disadvantage to everyone. It's a big ask. But I actually think with technology and with the right minds, we can make this happen. So again, just highlighting some of the great NASA and NOAA simulations, showing us the data, showing us where we're at and what we can do in the future. I put this uh, view up from International Space Station to show you that glow, that beautiful glow of our own life support system. That's our atmosphere. And if I shrink Earth down to the size of a basketball, our life support system is three human hairs thick. That beautiful life support system you see there, just so we can put it in perspective about the fragility of our beautiful, beautiful home planet. So then I'd like to end again with my shout out to STEM. Um, I've been an aerospace uh, you know, engineer my whole life. I can't think of a better job. I've always said being a professor at MIT is my favorite job. I got to serve NASA. That, that, uh, that shattered it. Now I have two favorite jobs in the world. And uh, again, I love being a rocket scientist. It is my passion, I wake up every day, but I have changed it to STEAM. So I put it on engineers and scientists. I think we have to change the conversation. I think we have to be inclusive. We made STEM a thing. And when I talk to little girls and boys out there and they say, oh STEM, that's not for me. We didn't get it right. We tried really hard, but we didn't get it right. So I'm all about changing the conversation now. How do we bring in the artists? How do we bring in the designers? Getting to Mars, searching in the solar system, Coming up with a new aircraft for the benefit of humanity, that takes all the best and the brightest. So we need to say whatever your passion is out there, you're in. So that's why I call it STEAM. I bring in designers, I bring in the artists. Uh, this is the Andy Warhol, how did we get to the moon? Great technology, but great dreams, great aspirations, because we said it was for humanity. You know, because we were very inclusive, we do have work to go, as Lisa pointed out. You know, we have the data, we have the studies, we have 13% uh, women engineers at NASA. We have 23% today scientists that are females at NASA. That's not good enough. You know, we aspire to we aspire to greatness. We aspire to much greater things. At MIT, I give you our numbers as well. We're very proud. We have 48% women undergraduates. But guess what? If I give you the graduate numbers in engineering, it goes down to 30%. If I give you the faculty numbers, 
it goes down. If I give you the full faculty numbers for underrepresented folks and women, you know, now we're in single digits. So that's not good enough. That's not who we are. I think we really can, you know, raise up. We're all in this together because excellence demands that we have diversity and inclusion. That's what excellence is all about. It's about bringing together all the best brains, everyone to the table. So I'm kind of bullish on that. Uh, again, we're working on it, but we do need the really radical transformative innovation in this area, I think. We can't just keep doing the same things that we've been doing. We do need some new ways. We need new alliances, I think, between government, industry, and academia. Uh, and Don't you know? So uh, thank you to Pharrell Williams for uh, this song, uh, but that captured it for me. You know, we're all able, uh, greatness comes if we're all at the table, if we're sitting at the table with folks who aren't like us, who don't look like us, who have different ideas. I love to be at the table with people who challenge me, who aren't an aerospace engineer, who make me think differently. And so Katherine Johnson's been mentioned, but it's her colleagues, and it really is uh, Langley who gave them all a shot in very divisive times, but it only takes one or two people to say yes, to always say yes, that can change human history, the course of history. Again, so I leave it there and shout out, it's been uh, too far out to celebrate this for, for Langley's past, but now I'm in touch with uh, Margot Lee Shetterly. It is a great book. I love the movie, but the book's even better. And now she's recording the history of all NASA women to make sure that history is written so that we can celebrate everyone and everyone's contributions. So it has been, again, my honor to serve NASA. It's a pleasure to be with you today and kind of a homecoming for me. And uh, I, for one, I'm thinking the most excited about the next 100 years of NASA Langley. One more story and tying back MIT and, and Langley doing my research actually to talk to you today. Uh, MIT, just, our Department of Aeronautics, we just celebrated our 100th just last year. And uh, Jerome Hunsaker started from the Navy and came out of really ocean engineering in the Navy and then taught the first aeronautics, hydrodynamics and aeronautics courses. That became MIT's, what happened to be, you know, the evolving Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics, teaming up with Langley then. And the first NASA technical report, which a lot of us were born and raised on these NASA, was co-authored then by Jerome Hunsaker from, uh, NASA, uh, from, from MIT and then uh, NASA Langley. So I got a copy of the first NASA technical report. Many, many, many more to come. But again, it just shows us, and I know we're gonna talk about the history and celebrate the space task force that, that the movie and hidden figures, so that Langley has a couple, two other startups that I just had to mention because they're so critical for all of us, for me being here today. I'm here because of Buzz and Neil and the Apollo program and NASA to have that dream to be an aerospace engineer. But Langley also was um, responsible for not just the Space Task Force, but the two startups previous to that. In 1946, Langley started PARD, pilotless, pilotless aircraft research division, which is today we call the NASA Wallops. And then in 1947, the other startup before, before the Space Task Force was the 